GPU programming is a bit of a hassle. There are multiple frameworks to do it, but they only work on some platforms, they use weird shading languages, or they don't support some features. In some cases, you have to combine several frameworks in a single project. I made an entire video just to complain about how impractical it gets. CPU programming, meanwhile, is much more convenient. An application written in a modern programming language can run on almost any CPU on the market. It used to be much worse. Developers would manually translate programs to target different CPU architectures and buy compiler toolchains to build their applications. But things improved a lot over time. So why is there such a big difference between the two? Why is GPU programming so chaotic? To answer this question, we first need to look at how CPU programming evolved. I promise it's important for the GPU section. A central processing unit, or CPU, is an electrical component in a computer that executes instructions, like mathematical calculations or input-output operations. It works by reading machine code, a sequence of instructions that looks like this. Writing machine code by hand is extremely tedious and error-prone, so since the 1940s, people have been using assembly languages. They map machine code instructions to simple mnemonics, which facilitates programming. But they remain pretty hard to use, and since assemblers are tied to specific CPU architectures, your code has to be adapted to different platforms. Another improvement came in the form of programming languages, like Fortran and C. They are more high-level than assembly. Instead of directly writing the instructions that the CPU will run, they use an abstract syntax made of keywords and mathematical symbols to express computations in a more intuitive way. The source code is then automatically converted into machine code by a compiler, which can target multiple CPU architectures. Programming languages are very convenient, so you might imagine that, at this point, CPU programming entered a golden era of smooth, easy development. It did not. Back in the 70s, the computer ecosystem was pretty fragmented, and it was common for companies to control their products tightly. IBM, for instance, manufactured most components of its mainframe computers and wrote most of the software. Computers built with that kind of vertical integration were expensive, but IBM liked it because it completely controlled the platform. Consumers were stuck in a vendor lock-in and had to rely on IBM for support. Apple had, still has, a similar strategy. It makes the hardware and software of its devices, and that gives it a lot of power. It would sell documentation and development tools back in the days. However, there are drawbacks to controlling your products too much. It makes you slower at adapting to the market, more vulnerable to supply chain disruptions, and it makes third-party development more difficult. IBM realized it. It wanted to enter the home computer market, but developing a new product from scratch would have taken too much time. So instead, it decided to assemble components made by other companies. And it worked! The IBM personal computer became a commercial success. It also backfired. The PC was well documented to help other companies make its components, and competitors used this open design to copy the PC and sell compatible clones. IBM was not happy, but it did reduce prices for consumers, and it did improve cross-compatibility. There's always a trade-off between openness and secrecy. If you publicly document your product, it's easier to develop it quickly and take over a market. But competitors can also free-ride it. If you keep your product as secret as possible, you can have higher margins, but it's more difficult to disrupt the market. We see the same thing with CPUs. When manufacturers document their chips well, it makes it easier for programmers to write and optimize code. That's a selling point. But manufacturers do not release the inner workings of their CPUs. They hide information and use legal protection to make sure that they preserve trade secrets. So manufacturers used to control how computers were made and what software they could run, but competition between companies somehow pushed for more openness, which made it easier for developers to write compilers themselves instead of relying on manufacturers. Paid compilers still exist, but they have become less common. We have free, cross-compatible ones now. Intel and IBM didn't publish documentation out of generosity, it was a business move, to sell more products than their competitors. These companies can actually get quite anti-competitive once they begin dominating a market. Another way to promote the interest of consumers is through public architectures. For example, RISC-V is an open CPU standard, originally developed by the University of California, Berkeley. Anyone can make a RISC-V CPU without getting sued or having to pay for a license, and that encourages innovation in this industry. 
CPU programming is not perfect, but without competition and open projects, it might have remained in the dark age of vertical integration. Hey, I wonder if another segment of the tech industry is still stuck in the same horrible business practices. A graphics processing unit, or GPU, is an electrical component that executes instructions in parallel. I know the name makes it seem like it's only for graphics, but practically any computation that can be split in parallel may benefit from GPUs. That includes physics simulations and DNA analyses, along with an obscure application called artificial intelligence. NVIDIA was the first company to formally define GPUs in the modern sense in 1998, but a lot of chips designed to manipulate images had been made before that. Initially, these chips were only intended to run graphics pipelines that would take vertices, process them, and output images. This is called fixed function programming. You can modify the parameters of the pipeline, but you cannot execute arbitrary code. Each manufacturer had its own way of doing things, so you had to adapt your code to each GPU. To address that, some companies made cross-platform standards like OpenGL and Direct3D, and developers adopted them because they improved productivity. Those are application programming interfaces, not compilers. They don't generate machine code the GPUs can run directly, but rather create standard instructions that GPU drivers convert into machine code. And a bit like at the beginning of the computer market, most GPU manufacturers would protect their architecture by releasing little detail about them. People couldn't write their own compilers, so the only way to use GPUs was through standard APIs or vendor-specific tools. In the early 2000s, GPU APIs began supporting shaders, programs that let you run code at some stages of the graphics pipeline to obtain more varied visual effects. And people realized that you can also use them to accelerate other applications. But remember, you had to go through the graphics pipeline. So people would put numbers in textures, write shaders to process the textures, launch the pipeline, and then analyze the output images to obtain results. That's a hideous hack, but they were stuck with it. Some projects tried to simplify that mess, but they were not backed by manufacturers and didn't really succeed. Eventually, NVIDIA caught a glimpse of developers struggling with general purpose programs and decided to release a framework called CUDA, which foregoes the graphics pipeline. That is worlds more convenient and it became popular to train neural networks. Many groundbreaking discoveries in the field were made using programs written with CUDA. And it remains widely used. NVIDIA is really dominant in the market, it controls around 90% of discrete GPUs, with AMD taking the rest, and Intel barely selling anything. Discrete GPUs are the ones used for high-end graphics applications and training AI models. Another type of GPUs are the integrated ones. They are more often used in applications that require less computations, and NVIDIA is not in that market. As we've seen with CPUs, a device manufacturer has an interest in making their products less compatible to preserve a market advantage. NVIDIA releases limited documentation of its GPUs, enough to help developers optimize their programs, but not enough for other manufacturers to make CUDA-compatible GPUs and free-ride its market. IBM documented the PC because it was desperate to take over home computers quickly, and that improved cross-compatibility. NVIDIA is already at the top, it doesn't need to disrupt the market by becoming more transparent. In an effort to win over some shares of the discrete GPU market, AMD and Intel document their GPUs more thoroughly, and their frameworks are open source. Not because they are freedom fighters, but to convince consumers to buy their products. However, their openness has not really paid off so far, and Nvidia is just too far ahead. Companies want to promote their own APIs to sell their own hardware, but they have to enable some degree of cross-platform support, otherwise no one would buy their chips. And these two interests often collide. For example, Apple developed OpenCL as a direct response to CUDA. It enables general-purpose computing on GPUs, but it's designed to run everywhere. Although several manufacturers support the first version, they decided not to support newer features to instead invest in their own APIs. OpenCL is a good API, but it stagnated over the years. Vulkan has similar issues. It was made to succeed OpenGL as a cross-platform graphics API, so it has a set of mandatory features that GPU manufacturers agreed to support. But some vendors wanted additional features that they had implemented on their own devices, so there are also optional Vulkan extensions that don't work everywhere. A certain company decided not to support Vulkan at all, so you have to use a weird compatibility layer on its devices. So we got 
another API to improve cross-platform support, and this one also has some missing features. I'm sure another project will address them. It never stops. Even when all manufacturers get together to make a common API, GPU programming always remains fragmented because of their competing interests. From what I've gathered, the lack of competition is the main problem that plagues GPU programming, but it's not the only one. On a technical level, GPUs are massively parallel and have a lot of variations. This complexity makes them more challenging to document than CPUs, which contributes to making the technology more opaque. And from a legal perspective, things have changed a lot since the early 80s. Governments have made it easier to copyright chip designs, and companies protect their intellectual property more aggressively. For instance, NVIDIA takes legal precaution to discourage running CUDA on other devices, again, to make sure that their consumers stay locked in the same ecosystem. Overall, GPU programming is chaotic mainly because NVIDIA's dominance hinders competition, which stalls cross-compatibility. NVIDIA didn't use shadowy scheming, but rather built good GPUs, invested early in a good API, and used legal magic to protect its IP. Nowadays, a lot of consumers are kind of locked in its ecosystem. I don't think Jensen Huang is a Final Fantasy villain who wants to make GPU programming more cumbersome for no reason. I think his company finds ways to maximize profit to the detriment of everyone else, like all companies do. But when they go too far, there can be consequences. In 1974, the US government filed an antitrust action against AT&T for monopolizing the telephone infrastructure. Monopolies, by the way, are legal according to the Federal Trade Commission, as long as you don't use them to harm the market with predatory practices. But since the 40s, AT&T had been sued for abusing its market power. There were multiple points of contention, but a particularly egregious one was its subsidiary Western Electric, which manufactured telephone equipment. AT&T controlled how a lot of phones were made and how they operated. It could dictate prices, and the situation became increasingly problematic. The United States and most other countries have competition laws, also called antitrust laws. They regulate monopolies, collusion, they supervise mergers and acquisition, they basically address any market behavior that may lead to predatory practices. AT&T was clearly going against antitrust laws, but before the state can break a monopoly, it has to prove that it is harming the market, and gathering enough evidence for that takes time. It took around 8 years to reach a settlement and AT&T got split in multiple companies. There have been more recent antitrust cases. Apple has some experience in that field, as well as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Intel, but they didn't get ripped apart a la AT&T. Yet. The US Department of Justice started investigating NVIDIA in 2024 because of its dominant market position. And like, yeah, it really looks like a monopoly. I would be the first one to cheer if CUDA was forced to become more transparent or if architectures were made more open, then GPUs would become more convenient to program. But that is highly unlikely and it would take at least several years, so let's not look forward to that. There are some arguments in favor of monopolies. For instance, you might argue that large companies are more productive than smaller ones and splitting monopolies too aggressively could hinder progress or that the state is run by incompetence and we should just let the market regulate itself. The worst argument is that once a company establishes a monopoly and extorts money, it creates a business opportunity. Another company can propose a cheaper product, which breaks the monopoly. But that almost never happens. Large companies have so much resources that they can easily put barriers to entry that prevent competition. No one could have competed with AT&T at the time, and I don't see how anyone could dislodge Nvidia now. The reality is that the invisible hand only works in a world of small shop owners. Large companies are too powerful for small competitors and they only work in their own interest. They are unaligned, if you will. The state has the responsibility to maintain a healthy economic environment and ensure that the rights of consumers are respected. At the same time, it is bound to follow judicial procedures so we may remain stuck with monopolies or quasi-monopolies for years. Rather than waiting for big government to do everything for us, we can ask ourselves if GPU programming might get better without antitrust miracles, and there are a few possibilities. The first one is to just hope for competition to get more intense. AMD and Intel are, um, doing their best, I'm sure, but they are not serious competitors. 
In China, more Xiancheng is a relatively new GPU manufacturer that could steer competition up. Maybe these companies will get better and push for more transparency. There are also projects to make open architectures, a bit like RISC-V but for GPUs, and they could encourage innovation and cross-compatibility. Another possibility is for consumers to put pressure on NVIDIA. Zum Beispiel, if developers start using open frameworks instead of CUDA, NVIDIA might decide to improve support for these projects. But we have no way of forcing NVIDIA to react positively to open source projects. I would definitely not favor more direct forms of pressure like boycotts because NVIDIA is so large that there's no way consumers could significantly alter its market presence. To be clear, boycotts are not useless. In many cases, they have successfully forced companies to fix problematic behaviors. But there's a limit to what boycotts can accomplish, and trying to make CUDA open source by cancelling NVIDIA on Twitter is not going to work. I think that the market is in a disastrous state, and the only thing we can do is live with it. Whether GPU programming will get better is out of our control, but we can slightly push for more transparency in that field with open source projects and by electing people who favor stricter antitrust regulations. Some of you might be sitting in disbelief at how much of a non-issue this whole situation is. GPU programming works! The applications you write in Vulkan or OpenCL or a game engine will function on almost any GPU on the market. There's no need to freak out. And fair, it's not that bad. We don't have to pay for GPU compilers at least. But it could be so much better. The CPU programming ecosystem is convenient enough that hobbyists can easily share their projects with people who don't necessarily have the same hardware. Python was started by one guy, it's now one of the most widely used programming languages, and anyone can contribute to it. This is the strength of openness. When you let people freely collaborate, the best ideas rise to the top and meliorate technology to the benefit of everyone. It's never perfect, but it's much better than when companies make the products incompatible on purpose. Another beef I have with GPU programming is that, in most cases, you have to keep the CPU and GPU source codes separate. There are projects like Rust GPU, OpenMP, and Sickled that let you integrate GPU code within CPU code, which is more convenient to write, but in practice, that code is compiled in pretty convoluted ways because GPUs are not built for compatibility. With more open architectures, we could develop open source, cross-platform compilers more easily. That would not impact graphics applications much, I think, but for general purpose computing, it would be really practical. Heterogeneous computing might become more widely used and enhance informatics as a whole. So I'm not exactly mad at the current GPU programming scene. Well, a little. I am disheartened because it has the potential to get much better, but we might never see that happen. Okay, I made my point. If you want more information on GPU programming, you can look up the GitHub repository I made to compare frameworks. I've added links to other interesting projects since last time. You can also check my other video on the topic, but I made some errors in it, so make sure to read my pinned comment for the errata. I hope I wasn't too discouraging. GPU programming is really fun and useful, despite what the market has done to it. I should do a video to prove that.